the roundtable is starting now. We are already one minute. Uh, we are one minute late. So let me introduce the roundtable. Dear participants, good morning or good afternoon uh, to all, uh, depending on your time zone. My name is Enrico Muratore Aprosio, and I am the WSCCC technical expert for Leave No One Behind, Equality, Non-Discrimination, and Gender. And I have the honor to welcome you all to the roundtable on including persons living in informal settlements in watch responses to COVID-19 to leave no one behind, which is organized by OHCHR, WSSCC, and WaterAid. I would like to thank you so much for a very significant turnout because uh, about 500 people registered and we have a maximum capacity for 500 uh, attendees. Now we have about uh, 112 participants that are joining. So we are looking forward to the others joining. So, our main objective today is not to talk about those who are furthest behind, but rather to give them the floor to talk for themselves. And we need to listen and learn how laws, policies, plans, and budgets can best integrate their concerns to more effectively respond to the pandemic. Today, 16 grassroots delegates representing 13 key populations living in informal settlements in Africa, in Asia, and in Europe, will tell us how COVID-19 and related responses are affecting them, and will make recommendations to governments, UN agencies, development partners, and donors, so that these duty bearers can more adequately address their specific needs in responding to the virus and its impacts, and beyond the pandemic, accelerate the achievement of, of SDG 6 and all SDGs for all and realize their human rights to water and sanitation and interrelated human rights from the right to health care to the right to adequate housing leaving no one behind. So the groups in focus today will be 13. This includes women and girls, children and youth, older persons, persons with disabilities, persons living with HIV, sex workers, LGBTIQ, healthcare workers, sanitation workers, migrant workers, homeless, refugees, and minorities, all of them living in informal settlements. The interventions of delegates of these key populations will follow a short film and two presentations about national wash responses to COVID-19 in South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria's informal settlements. The successive session of the roundtable will provide instead governments, UN agencies, and development partners the opportunity to react to the recommendations made by the vulnerable groups. And finally, we will have with us uh, Mr. Balakrishnan Rajagopal, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Ad Adequate Housing, who will uh, wrap up the discussions and provide his analysis and recommendations from the human rights perspective. Please note that because of the very high number of speakers, time management will be extremely strict. Interventions going beyond two and a half minutes will have to be muted. However, all, all attendees, including those who are not scheduled to speak, are welcome to provide any written inputs or recommendations through the chat box. So please use it. All the inputs received will be considered for the report that will be produced and disseminated after the roundtable. Please note that all the interventions and discussions will be recorded. As we start, I would ask all attendees, each of you, regardless of whether you intend to provide inputs or not, to use the chat box also to write your full name, your professional title and organization, the country where you operate, and your email address. We will need this information to be able to share the roundtable report with you once it is ready. So as the time is very short, uh, we go for the opening and I would like to give uh, the floor to Rio Ada, team leader, economic, social and cultural rights at OHCHR to start the meeting. Thank you very much. Rio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Enrico. At OHCHR, UN Human Rights Office, we're extremely pleased to collaborate with WSSCC and other partners in organizing this one table today. Um, this event is also a part of the global marking of the 10th anniversary of the Human Rights of Water and Sanitation, the formal recognition by the UN General Assembly in 2010. 
And that recognition led to elevating the importance of water and sanitation as a standalone goal in the SDG framework in the 2030 agenda and the progress over the last 10 years. But with 10 more years ago in the 2030 agenda, we are still off track. The COVID-19 pandemic is setting back the ears of progress in a matter of just a few months. Moreover, the pandemic has revealed structural inequalities and underinvestment in key economic and social rights, health, housing, water and sanitation, social protection. Um, the voices we will hear today at this round table, the voices of those who are most affected by the crisis, will give us a reality check on where we stand today in the realization of human rights to water and sanitation and all other related human rights. And those testimonies from the speakers will also highlight, I hope, the critical linkages between the rights to water and sanitation and other human rights and the impact of inequalities and intersectional discrimination in this COVID crisis, but also beyond. Our office is actively engaged in the UN socioeconomic responses at country level and integrates human rights in the UN country team's efforts to support governments and partners in addressing the pandemic with focus on addressing inequalities and leaving no one behind. Uh, last week, UN Water launched the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework to support countries' efforts in accelerating progress through better coordination among sectors. It has a strong focus on addressing inequality in access to water and sanitation, including. And above all, we need the engagement of all stakeholders across sectors in order to accelerate the progress. And I hope that today's roundtable will shed a light on the way forward to build back better and highlight the practical value of human rights-based approach in seeking solutions and ensuring access to water and sanitation for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rio. Uh, now uh, I would like to invite James Wicken, the head of the Global Policy Advocacy and Innovation Unit at WSSCC. To intervene. Thank you, Enrico and, and Rio, for your for your welcome. On behalf of WSSCC, I'd like to thank everybody for joining today, and especially for the speakers for generously sharing their experiences and perspectives. Allow me to say just a few words um, about our organisation and to set the scene for the interaction today. Given the extent of the global sanitation and hygiene crisis. We need to act now, catalyze change, and accelerate collective and sustained commitment to tackle the challenge that Rio outlined. Based on lessons learned from the water supply, sanitation, and collaborative councils previous work, and that of other global funds, WSSCC is now evolving into the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund. Uh, this fund aims to fill a gaping void in the international response to the sanitation, hygiene, and menstrual health crisis, and to create a mechanism to take this response to a new level. Um, this is a fund that will focus on countries and communities with the highest sanitation and hygiene burden and the least ability to respond, with leave no one behind agenda at the center. Over these last six months, we have co-organized a number of consultations with key populations on topics related to the human right to water and sanitation, as Rio said during this special 10th anniversary year, and reducing inequalities in delivering the Sustainable Development Goals. These consultations took place in New York, uh, in Rishikesh in India, and it's nice to see some colleagues from Rishikesh with us today. As part of that, that was as part of the voluntary national review process. Um, we had consultations in Geneva and now virtually. Time and time again in these consultations, key populations have advised us to listen carefully to your voices and your realities, and that's what I'm most looking forward to doing today. Back in April, in the first few months of the global pandemic, the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership held a webinar on eliminating inequalities in the WASH response to COVID-19. During that webinar, we clearly saw COVID-19 impacting 
on the WASH situation of all key populations. And amongst these people, we heard how these challenges are even further amplified by people living in close proximity in informal settlements. And that was the genesis of the webinar today. With thanks to colleagues at Asi Vikilani, and I believe there may be some on the webinar today, we would like to bring this reality of what we're talking about today into the webinar by starting with a very short film on their work in Cape Town to set the scene. So if I could ask my colleague Bob to start the film. Thank you, colleagues. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. So I, I don't know whether I was very clear. We are learning how to use all these new methodologies uh, under COVID-19. 
Anyway, uh, I will suggest that we move uh, forward uh, to the next uh, intervention by Li Fang. Uh, Li Fang is the OHCHR Senior Human Rights Advisor at UNCT Kenya. Please, Li Fang, okay. you can take the floor. Thank you. I believe that there's, um, there's, there's a presentation that I've shared. If we can maybe just, uh, we can start with that presentation. Um, and just, you can maybe go to the third slide. So just next slide. Yes, that one, thank you. I just want to start with an outline in terms of where the, what the, um, the context is in, in Kenya um, in terms of framework. Uh, the rights to water and sanitation are actually guaranteed in the Bill of Rights in the Constitution from 2010, which is an excellent Bill of Rights. Um, and it guarantees the right to clean and safe water in adequate quantities and also to re reasonable standards of sanitation. Um, the UN Development Assistance Framework is really trying to look at how to support the achievement of these rights, um, aiming to have an increased proportion of the population who have access to sustainable and safe drinking water and sanitation. And this is to progressively eliminate uh, inequalities. Um, if you can go to the next slide, because despite this framework, unfortunately, in reality, there are deep inequalities in the enjoyment of the right to water in, in Kenya. Um, a significant proportion of the population does not have access to safe and reliable sources of, of drinking water. And whilst in general, um, urban areas have better access to water than rural areas, inequalities are particularly acute in informal urban settlements. And in, in urban settlements, um, residents draw on both reliable and unreliable water sources from formal and informal um, providers which has a, a big impact on achieving sustainable develop, de, development goal six. And because of this, with this in mind, um, OHCHR partnered with the Social Justice Centers Working Group, today represented by um, Gacheke Ngachihi, who's going to speak after me. Um, this is a network of grassroots human rights defenders who, um, who are working in informal settlements and vulnerable communities. And we partnered with them to undertake a human rights assessment of the right to water in Kenya focusing on informal urban settlements and really looking to try to identify and gather data on challenges and inequalities in access to an affordability of water. So if you, um, if you move to the next slide, you'll see a range of graphs. I'm, I'm just going to summarize some of these. The assessment was undertaken through household surveys in December 2019 in informal settlements in Nairobi, Mombasa and Kisumu. And you'll see that from, from the findings, in terms of availability, only a minority of, of, um, of respondents in informal settlements have, ac have regular access to public water supply, which is actually regulated and less costly. You'll see that the majority of respondents in dry season rely on private water suppliers, um, which is more, um, more expensive. In terms of affordability, um, it, the for affordability is a great big, uh, a big challenge because the majority of respondents spent more than 3% of their monthly household income on water. And this illustrates the inequalities um, because in urban areas, water commonly costs less per litre in middle class neighbourhoods where there's piped water than in informal settlements where the majority rely on, on water vendors. So if we go to the, um, the, the next slide, um, Shortly after we had concluded this assessment on the right to water, the first case of COVID-19 was confirmed in Kenya in, on 13th of March, 2020. And with regular hand washing being a primary prevention measure, this clearly linked the right to water and the right to health in informal settlements. So 10 days later, um, OHCHR and the social justice centers embarked on joint monitoring of the human right, rights impacts of COVID in informal settlements. And this had a very strong focus on the right to water building on the previous assessment and the identification of the inequalities in access and affordability. Um, I will just take you to the next slide. Um, there's a lot of graphs, but just I will summarize some of the key findings, which is that in terms of availability, about a third of households uh, surveyed in the informal settlements had access to public water sources. But the frequency of water uh, availability was very low and erratic. Um, and the households indicated that water availability had worsened after the COVID-19 outbreak. In terms of affordability, um, there was a, a, a very quick increase in water 
um, after the outbreak of COVID due to the increased in, increase in demand and inadequate supply. And in fact, um, in some, some, in the most uh, Nairobi settlements which were surveyed, the cost of water per 20 litre jerry can almost doubled. In terms of sanitation, the majority of the population did not have access to sat uh, adequate sanitation facilities. The cost of public toilets remained roughly the same, but the cost of public showers had increased. I'm then going to skip the next slide, um, which goes and then go to that one, which is the results and findings of the second round. So we did a second round of, of monitoring um, in April and May. At that point, there had been some positive developments. The Ministry of Water and Sanitation had instructed county governments to provide, um, to direct water service providers to provide free water to informal settlements for three months and to dis suspend dis disconnection of water. There had been improvements in the availability of, of, um, of water in terms of, of access to public water supply, um, but the frequency of availability of water was still irregular. Um, there had been 14% of households who had access to new sources of water, but mostly through NGOs and, and donations, and only 14% of respondents had access to free water. In terms of affordability, the cost of water remained elevated across the surveyed communities in all counties compared to um, the, the situation prior to COVID. So if I go to the last slide, I'll just recap some very quickly some of the key um, recommendations going forward and then hand over to Gacheke. I think what it shows is that the COVID-19 crisis has, has really revealed the inequalities in access to water and sanitation. And I think that this is an opportunity to use this crisis to address these inequalities <coughs> and improve access for, for people in, in informal settlements. I think that to do this, it's really important to promote participation of, of communities in devising um, COVID-19 watch responses. And I'll hand over to Gacheke. Thank you very much, Ling. I, Li, Li Fang, I really appreciate for the, what you have given up, the, the what, uh, human rights assessment that we did with the UN. I really appreciate for that background. It give me an opportunity to input my my concern. First of all, when we say uh, leaving no one behind, uh, when COVID-19 came in March, uh, as uh, Li Fang has shared that majority of informal centers, they didn't have water. We have a crisis in the housing, the sewage were in a very bad situation. So this this uh, slogan of li no, not leaving anyone behind, Already, majority of the poor people are already left behind, as you have seen in the Cape Town and everywhere. You see, behind of me is a small jerry can that people are using to wash hands. Uh, this is the Madare environment where many of people they don't have uh, access to clean water, no toilets. Even the toilet they don't have, they don't have toilet or water. So we are still having a crisis. Even after we did the human rights uh, monitoring and showed assessment. Yes, it's more improvement. The government started bringing um, Rolly with the small uh, tanks, waters, but that did not last long. In the last two, one, two months from uh, uh, May, uh, June, uh, there has been a shortage of water in Coyote. many other informal sector spaces. So what we are saying is that we must increase this demand for the government to provide make sure that we have to make sure that we continue demanding the government to provide clean water to informal settlement. At the moment, the peak of COVID-19 is affecting ordinary poor people, especially the marginalized. No. Uh, uh, I'm saying that unless the government start providing water to the informal settlement, we'll have a major crisis as the COVID-19 disease is starting affecting majority of the people. Today, we have almost 15,000 cases, and majority of these are affecting ordinary poor people now. So in the first week of uh, March, April, the disease has not spread, but at the moment it's spreading very fast, and it's going to affect majority of the poor people and marginalized areas. Um, 
So I joined myself with the recommendation made by UN Human Rights Office, which did this uh, human rights assessment together. So we, and I have seen there are more government uh, representatives, uh, water or water bodies from the UN. What we can say, this is not sustainable at the moment because it's just uh, one jerry can, people putting water there. It cannot uh, support uh, a population of uh, half a million or uh, in Kibera, Madari, and other spaces. So we continue doing the campaign of demand of clean water to everybody, and the government provide people with the best uh, commodities of food. Uh, crisis of housing is also with us. So uh, as an informal sentiment and uh, poor people, we are still demanding the government to put more resources to the uh, providing of people with the best needs like water and sanitation. All the resources have been fundraised. They should not go to bail out um, companies. They should come and support people with the clean water. I am with the young people who are not in schools. They are helping people to wash. These are young girls from primary high schools. They are the ones who are manning the, the, these stations provided by UN habitants. Even themselves, they are also struggling. They are not in school, but they are helping people to wash their hands. So what we can say, unless government put resources where the, where the poor people are, it will be difficult for us to combat COVID-19. Yeah. Thank you, Gacheki. Yeah. That was a strong intervention. We will have uh, also a representative of the government of Kenya will be able to respond. Now, please use your uh, mic and. Uh, um, so thanks a lot. Uh, we are on time. Uh, we try to continue like that. Uh, we would like to give the floor to Nigeria, Sadra Guzu. Uh, it works for United Purpose Nigeria and for uh, the uh, Global Sanitation Fund uh, program uh, in Nigeria called Rashpin. And he's going to talk to us about uh, proactively targeting persons living with disabilities. Please, uh, Shadrach, are you there? Yeah, hi, Enrico. Hi, everyone. You can go, you can move ahead. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, so, Enrico has rightly introduced me. I work for United Purpose, and I will quickly be sharing um, with you how we are uh, proactively and engaging with persons living with disabilities um, on our uh, COVID-19 intervention in Nigeria. Um, <clears throat> The Rushkin program um, is a WSSCC Global Sanitation Fund supported program, and we've been running for a couple of years in Nigeria, um, engaging with communities and um, individuals in rural and peri-urban settlements to, to support them to end open defecation and improve on their hygiene and sanitation practices. We have succeeded in achieving a lot of great um, results. And that we have also used to influence the wash sector in Nigeria. A couple of months back, um, just like many other organizations and programs, we refocused our program to address um, the global pandemic COVID-19 and um, carry out um, related wash interventions in that area. And um, right from the onset, we recognized the fact that certain groups um, within uh, the, the the metropolis, uh, in Benue City, Makudi Metropolis in Benue City, Nigeria, may be left behind um, in the interventions that were going, uh, going on in the state. And we collaborated with um, our local partner, Unispring of Life, who has vast experience and knowledge and, and skill in, in engaging with persons living with disabilities. And we carry out a small intervention um, in the first, first phase of that intervention, we, we, we brought out, we, we, we engaged with 47 representatives of persons living with disabilities cut across different forms of disabilities, including the visually impaired, um, hearing impaired, amputees, and persons with mobility challenges. And um, through that process, we carried out sensitization, um, so we translated the government's approach. Approved um, COVID-19 messages into Braille, 
uh, that was targeted at persons um, with visual impairment. And we also got um, engaged with persons with hearing imp uh, impairment through uh, sign language uh, interpreters. Uh, we also we, we wanted to find out from the, uh, the level, the added level of uh, disadvantage they may, they may be facing as a result of COVID-19. And so we engaged with them through focus group discussions and, and experience sharing. And we got a few learnings and key points from that, which I'll share in the recommendations. And also, we, we carried out skill uh, training for them um, to help them meet their immediate um, uh, hygiene needs. So we did um, training on hand sanitizer making, liquid soap, re reusable menstrual pads, and face masks. Um, please, if you go to the, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? If you can hear me, Enrico, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so from uh, focus group discussions and testimonials, we, we categorized the findings into three. Um, the first was um, hygiene and health-related issues. And they put to us that they have inabilities, uh, these groups of uh, persons living with disabilities, that they have in, uh, inability to, pro uh, to practice proper physical distancing because of their need for aid. So they always have a need to have someone with them. They are not sure of um, the person's um, compliance to the COVID-19 rules, and they're not sure uh, if that can end up infecting them. And they also ha uh, have inability, experience inability to avoid touching surfaces because they usually need to get touch surfaces for support, hold on to surfaces for support, or some even crawl on the ground. And the economic issues were, um, the first point, difficulty getting jobs regardless of uh, education and skill. Uh, this is due to discrimination. This is uh, besides COVID-19, but uh, discrimination of persons living with disabilities, even if they have the education and skill needed for jobs. Um, however, COVID-19 um, has worsened it because they've ended up, uh, most of them have, have ended up losing their sources of livelihood. For the ones that had businesses or even the ones that go out on the street to beg, and the lockdown restrictions have um, taken that away. Um, also, uh, the social and um, spiritual issues, um, closure of um, worship centers, uh, the lockdown has is, um, reduced the social support they've been getting from family, and friends, and churches, and uh, mosques, and all, uh, all the worship centers they worship with. And um, yeah, so the recommendations we got from them, out of a long list, uh, we are prioritizing three, I have two on the slide, to set up uh, more inclusive skill acquisition avenues and employment opportunities. And- We have adopt, another 20 seconds to conclude. Yeah, definitely. To adopt inclusive design um, of facilities to allow them better access. So there's this um, surge of um, hand washing stations with um, food Food pad for for dispensing of water and soup, and that's all over the, the the town and the city. And they are saying that is not inclusive enough because the persons that have mobility challenges are unable to use that. And finally, they said that they need to be involved in every. Okay, uh, part I'm of sorry. Society. I'm sorry, I need to stop uh, you here because the time is short. Uh, so we have to move to the next session. Uh, as informed, we are very sorry that we have to be very rude, but we have no choice. Everybody needs uh, more opportunities to speak. So, Shadrach, thank you, and uh, send your input in writing to everyone. Uh, all those who cannot finish the presentations, they can still uh, uh, send inputs in writing. Now, I would like to give the floor to Rose Ozinde Alabaster, who is the Director of the Water Environment and Human Development Initiative, WEDI who will uh, moderate the next session on interventions of CSOs and representatives of most vulnerable groups living in informal settlements. And again, please uh, stick uh, to the allocated time, two minutes and a half, after two minutes, we will be reminded not to, to conclude and, uh, and then we will be muted.
Thank you, Roz. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Enrico. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, on the, in this session, of course, uh, the speakers have already been informed and they are ready to speak. So let's stick to two, two and a half minutes. My bell will ring. Uh, you'll hear a bell, so I will need to talk so that I don't interrupt. Uh, so I'll first give the, 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 the floor to Marianne Casina. Uh, Marianne is uh, the co-founder of Kayole Community Justice Center, and she's also the convener Women in Justice Centers. And uh, this session, we'll be looking at women and girls at the vulnerable groups, and let's hear the voices uh, from them. So uh, if, Marianne, you can put on your video, uh, and, and then you can take the floor, please. Marianne? Marianne Casina, are we, are we there? She was here previously. Maybe she had a problem with internet. Okay, so maybe we swap uh, Marianne with uh, Bangladesh and we can have Shaila Shahid and uh, Marianne can speak after. So Shaila Shahid is the Senior Advisor, Climate Change, uh, Disaster Risk Reduction and Gender from the International Center of Climate Change and Development, ICCCAD. And he's also the women's major group representing the Global South. So let's hear from Shaila, please. Thank you, Rose. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good evening and good afternoon. So uh, today I'd like to reiterate uh, the COVID-19 global pandemic is an unprecedented crisis and likely to be a defining moment in the history. COVID-19 poses direct threats and impacts with immediate consequences on human health. The severity of the COVID-19 disease outbreak poses grave detrimental impacts on war service provision and sustainability of services in the global south, particularly for the women and girls. WASH is a key preventive measure in reducing the spread of COVID-19 and the principal public health delivers. Putting gender equality, therefore, and inclusion and rights at the center of COVID-19 water sanitation and hygiene response, therefore, is crucial to overcome this situation. If we draw uh, evidence from South Asia and across Bangladesh, many improvised communities face a precarious existence in crowded environments, making them particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. Many Bangladeshis live in densely populated urban and slum areas and Rohingya refugees are stuck in cramped square shelters with up to 10 family members to a room. Maintaining physical distance in this setting is nearly impossible with poor access to soap or clean water. This burden of lockdowns, lack of adequate access to work services, disease burden, and failures in public health primarily fall on the shoulders of women who often shoulder the responsibility to care for children without schooling and care for sick family members and unable to access health care and for sustaining families without incomes. The outbreak has already affected women and girls unprecedentedly and other vulnerable populations disproportionately. Gender norms in both refugee and host communities like these informal settlements limit women's and girls' ability to protect themselves from the virus and have a significant impact on prevention and response efforts and mitigation-related responses. Therefore, special protection requires for the women, sanitation, and waste workers and all those women who are living in those refugee environment. And we also need to remember the migrant women and migrant workers. We urge the government's donor and UN for equitable access to wash commodities and services that must be protected without any form of discrimination by nationality, income, or ethnicity. Governments need to ensure that gender impacts of the measures implemented during the pandemic are taken into account and negative impacts are avoided, as well as we also demand to use the intersectionality analysis to map differentiated wash impacts of vulnerable groups like women and adolescent girls. We also urge to focus on menstrual hygiene management in this pandemic situation, and those are already affected by the intersecting power of globalization, fundamentalism, militarism, and patriarchy. Any response to COVID-19 must be gender responsive and advance gender equality by ensuring fulfillment of women's human rights as recognized in CEDAW, SDGs, and okay, other- Okay, uh, time is up, uh, Shaila. Thank you. Uh, so next, uh, we shall have, um, I, I'll follow uh, a different program. I had a small uh, mishap here. Uh, so next, we'll have children and youth uh, represented by uh, Mr. Aditya Sharegonka. Aditya Sharegonka is a doctoral scholar at TISS Mumbai. 
uh, uh, he works uh, on improving the care rights for vulnerable children. Uh, Dr. Adita, please. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, so I'm working on the youth care labor uh, across India. Uh, so a youth care labor is a, defined as a young adult or youth who left the institutional or any other alternative care. And uh, in COVID-19 pandemic crisis, we are struggling very hard as that I uh, personally witnessed as a coming out from the institutional care, how it is difficult that I personally uh, experienced. And especially after leaving the institutional care in, during this COVID-19, uh, we many youth have lost the job, uh, then lack of financial support or backup to pay the rented accommodation and grocery that lead the mental health. And adding to that, staying alone, leading a serious mental health issue and that's because we, uh, uh, since a uh, long time, our data, I mean, the government and, and the NGO not keeping the data properly uh, after leaving the uh, institutional care. And that's the major reason we are facing today, huge struggle to even pay the rented uh, house and uh, simple for the grocery. So as a being a care liver, I uh, have taken the initiative uh, through developing a Google form and collected the data, that is, we have collected more than 800 care liver from my state of Maharashtra. And then along with that, I also developed the WhatsApp group and task force with the like-minded volunteers and professional experts. And through that, we have started promoting awareness and advocacy with the UNICEF and the government to create the support, uh, support for the youth care liver as well as the children in need of care and protection under the uh, uh, institutional care. I personally raised a fund with my uh, team of care liver and my mentor supporters to uh, almost 5 lakh rupees. And we had distributed the almost 650 care livers of uh, grocery through online payment, medical support and mental health services through expert. And uh, also we have now started in uh, uh, another phase that we started job preparation with the care liver and job readiness sessions and also uh, along uh, tying with the local uh, NGOs and UNICEF support. Along with that, we are also working on documentation and dissemination of the uh, report of the, uh, yeah, challenges and support. My recommendation is that youth care level should be provided financial assistance as well as the support with a job in the po uh, post COVID-19 situation. All care level should have the rights and guidance and financial support for housing after they leave the care. A place to sleep is a basic need and very important. It is important to learn how to find a house, flat, room, and how to keep it. They should have scholarship for education, support to access electronic material, free counseling services, setting up peer network and sub, uh, support group. They should have access to have a nutritious food, hygiene related item, and access to health services. Each care liver must get the legal document before they leave the care specially ration card and passport and last but not least there should have social protection measures for care liver with the gender and ability friendly approaches uh, so thank you so much for giving me opportunity to share my experiences and the recommendation uh, thank you uh, next uh, representing and speaking for all the persons we have uh, uh, mr mk raina the vice president of all india senior citizens confederation and he's also the director of Shelter Homes for Senior Citizens. Uh, Mr. Reiner. Mr. Reiner? Uh, please unmute yourself. I have to unmute? unmute Hi, it is already. Yeah, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Yes, it is done. Mr. Enrico Muratore and friends, Namaste. I am M.K. Raina from All India Senior Citizen Confederation and Shehjar Homes, Haridwar, India. I will be speaking on behalf of elderly group, early 60 years plus in India, constituting about 12% of the population. Elderly have been the easy target in this pandemic. Besides elderly face difficulty, in accessing medical and social services. There was shortage of caregivers. Physical distancing increased isolation and burdened elderly 
as most of them are not used to online social interaction it was however observed that urban and dense areas were more affected than the rural areas care dependent elderly became anxious restless angry and also withdrawn there were increased reports of neglect and abuse public health system proved fragile government communication at times were weak fake messages rampant in social media medical emergency plans did not adequately focus on the safety of elders deep rooted ageism in our societies became more apparent it was reported that due to scarce medical resources treatment decisions were taken considering age and not medical needs we need to in pandemic times cultivate compassion raise awareness of and protection from the virus promote healthy behavior and social norm change eliminate stigma and discrimination of older persons through community networks including youth and women organization and religious leaders public health actions are needed to protect the rights of older persons and prevent abuse during pandemic budgets to be provided in proportion to required preparedness protection of elderly ensuring equal realization of their rights including access to health with intent of leave no one behind governments to arrange detailed elderly population data with living status to plan for needed community reach and medical support during pandemic living with covid will need collective understanding that vulnerability can be protected through preventive intervention thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, fantastic uh, now we move with people uh, to the people with disabilities and we welcome mr shwagat malik uh, from the center uh -huh. for advocacy and research and also uh, orthopedically handicapped uh, since birth uh, so uh, mr malik please yes yes Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I hope my name is Swagat Shankar Malik from Bhubaneswar. I hope you all are be safe in during COVID-19 situation. I'm a orthopedical handicap since my birth. Uh, I have been working for rights of person with disability for last five years, uh, including my two years association with CIFAR. So now I am uh, sharing some key concerns uh, for person with disability. Uh, first one is uh, uncaring and in, uh, insensitive attitudes towards person with disability, uh, particularly since more during the difficult time of COVID-19 situation. And uh, second one is no proper integration with uh, mainstream institutions in, including education, healthcare, water, and sanitation, and no opportunity for skill and livelihood. Even during uh, outbreaking of any disaster and uh, in any uh, emergency uh, response such as cyclone and in COVID-19, there is no sensitivity and inclusion of special need of person with disability. So this is the main uh, key concerns um, uh, for person with disabilities. Now I am sharing some key recommendation for person with disabilities. First one is implement the right of person with disability act. And second one is uh, collaborate with disabled people's organizations and networks to ensure that all COVID-19 related uh, precautions uh, care and medical support and uh, mitigation measures uh, reach person uh, with disability and uh, guidance with availability uh, of 24 into 7 functional helpline. It is uh, um, some key uh, recommendation for person with disabilities because person with disabilities also have rights. It is important to mainstream them by creating more job opportunity. The pension also should be increased so that they can be lived a life of dignity and respect. Thank you so much for um, sharing my experience. 
during this Thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. Uh, now we move to persons with HIV, and we have India, uh, Madam Mona Balani uh, from Ways Medical Institute. Please take the floor. Mad Madam Balani? Yes, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, and have, uh, have you, have you, yeah, you can have your, your uh, picture on as well. Hi, good. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Turn the video, please. And go. Yes. My video is not. Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, greeting from India. Myself, Mona Balani, as a person living with HIV since last 20 years. And um, I am representing here National Coalition uh, of People Living with HIV from India. And uh, uh, like as uh, uh, we want to share that uh, as a coalition of people uh, living with HIV from the different uh, groups uh, of key population and uh, all genders. Uh, so, irrespectively, we are working with all uh, gender groups and uh, age groups. Uh, and across India, around uh, uh, 11.5 lakh people uh, we have uh, uh, with us. Uh, directly or indirectly, we are serving to them and their family members. So, during this COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, as a pandemic of uh, other uh, disease also like uh, HIV, TB, malaria, and other uh, co-infection. Um, along with HIV. So uh, during this time, our priority was uh, uh, to uh, provide the antiretroviral to the people in India uh, during this uh, critical situation. So we have ensured that uh, all people living with HIV should be served uh, with antiretroviral uh, medicines at their doorstep, where they step uh, in that uh, critical situation. So we have provided around uh, uh, seven lakh people uh, all together in India uh, by home delivery and community health dispensing uh, these life saving uh, medicines. So, uh, along with this medicine, uh, we also provided the support uh, for the emergent uh, needs uh, like nutrition and food, along with the medicines and uh, safety kits like uh, hand sanitizer, uh, gloves, face masks, and uh, uh, hand soaps. So while we were going uh, to the home to home uh, for providing these all these things, we came to know like many of people also have the trouble with their uh, employments and their educations and uh, the other needs like uh, uh, not able to going out uh, due to the lack of travel and all support. Thirty so seconds. We also found uh, like women living with HIV and young female with HIV are facing the trouble uh, to access the safe water, sanitary pads and uh, other uh, things. So we are re recommending that all these challenges like uh, safe water, safe toilets, uh, uh, hygiene uh, stuff by the government and non-government organization, it was really a challenge. So we are recommending that uh, need to have uh, sensitization trainings uh, during this uh, pandemic period, as well as for the hygiene, health and hygiene uh, educates were much required. Ensure the all uh, basic personal hygiene kits to be provided to the people people living with HIV in the field and in their local areas where they are residing. Okay, Balani, I'm sorry, we have to stop. Uh, yes, kindly yes. put the rest of the information on the chat box. Uh, we need to move to the sex workers uh, representatives, and we have two representatives, Miss Rada and Miss Sultana Begam. Uh, they'll take also 2.5 minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, this are uh, part of uh, HIV prevention program. They facilitated sex workers access to social entitlements and advocated with state governments for social security schemes and pension for single and destitute women. Uh, Ms. Begum is joint secretary uh, in all India network sex workers and secretary of Sabudaya Samiti, a CBO led by sex workers in Ajmer. So please go ahead. Uh, namaste ma'am. My name is Sultana Begum. I am Ajmer, Rajasthan, India. Se हाँ मैं अपने सारी सेक्स वर्कर बहनों के लिए एक मुद्दा रखना चाहती हूँ कि जो अभी हम लोग सेक्स वर्कर बहनें पहले से समुदाय से हटकर थे समाज में भेदभाव करते थे समाज में हमारी कोई मान सम्मान नहीं होती थी अब जब से कोविड 19 हुआ है जब से तो हमारी हालत बहुत बुरी है 
हमारे पास ना तो खाने को पैसा है ना खाने को राशन है ना किराए को देने के लिए कोई पैसा है हमारे पास में अभी ऐसी हालत हो गई है कि हमारे भूख के मरने की नौबत आ गई है हमारा धंधा बंद हो गया है हमारा रोजगार बंद हो गया है हमारे पास में कुछ भी ऐसा नहीं है कि हम अपने परिवार को लेके पाले पोसे संभाल के रखे तो हम चाहते हैं सरकार के तरफ से हमें कुछ ऐसा बजट मिले ताकि हमारे को सात हजार रुपये महीने के पेंशन मिले ताकि हम अपने परिवार को चला सके अभी हमारी स्थिति बहुत बुरी है हमारे साथ मैं पूरी इंडिया के सेक्स वर्कर बहनों की तरफ से मुद्दा रख रही हूँ आप लोगों से निवेदन करती हूँ कि आप लोग इस मुद्दे को सरकार तक पहुँचाए हमारी भी आवाज़ उठाए हमारे लिए मान सम्मान करे हमें भी वो अधिकार दे जो कि आम जनता को मिलती है आम पब्लिक को मिलती है धन्यवाद आई एम ट्रांसलेटिंग फॉर सुल्ताना बेगम अजमेर राजस्थान इंडिया We are excluded earlier, and now we have been further marginalised. We are on the verge of starvation due to complete loss of livelihood, no food to eat, and cash to meet even our petty household expenses. Struggling to pay house rent, our children are affected worst. With all these, many of our sisters are forced to return back to their villages with no option or source of income. We recommended. our vulnerability and present crisis should be recognized there should be a budget provision in all key departments for sex workers and special provision for free ration and the minimum financial assistance of rupees 7000 per month to meet our expenses like all other informal workers in our country thank you thank you very much and uh, that was quite precise uh now we move to a uh, representation uh from the gender the transgender lgbti uh from nairobi kenya we have uh, miss maina maya who is a member of dandora community justice center and an advocate for lgbtiq rights and singer using her music career to give voice to lgbtiq and the voiceless welcome miss maina um just to let you know um Maya Maina is actually in the attendees she needs to be upgraded to panelist so that she can speak i sent a message through before and i was also i have Marianne Casina on the line um she has had problems dialing back into zoom but i can put her on audio on speaker so that she can speak from audio from this connection okay thank you very much for that point i think then as as enrico sorts that out with his team we can have the healthcare worker representative and then we can have mina once that is sorted out so i think she might already be ready, there yeah. actually she's ready she, she's ready okay i'm uh, sorry about that so mina you can go ahead please miss mina okay she can come again later then uh, can you put your 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 on mute i think because we can't hear you because i can see hear you speaking see you speaking but you can't hear okay i will let are you are you ready you can hear me yes we can hear you go ahead please okay. hope you can hear me yeah please go ahead yes okay from us it's all about sexual and reproductive health issues as uti since they cannot access adequate safe and clean water uh we have another issue sexual and gender based violence due to lgbt searching for water late nights to avoid being mocked by some community members we have another one mental instability since they cannot fetch water with other community members due to stigma and discrimination and then we have inability to afford man money to buy water increases the risk to covid-19 so we have some recommendations since the we have some recommendation to ensure there is transparency and equality in distribution of resources another one is to have lgbt representative in covid-19 response the other one is to allocate a support toolkit for lgbt to support them during this hard time and then 
we have another one to allocate resources for cycle social support. And then we have another one, the last one, is economic empowerment programs so that they can support themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maina. Uh, now let's move to the healthcare workers from India, uh, represented by Ms. Pinky Nayak from the Center for Advocacy and Research. Uh, she played a key role in convincing women for institutional delivery, immunization of children, family planning, and health seeking behavior. Uh, Ms. Pinky, please go ahead. Samastang Namaskar. Samast Samastang Namaskar. Mona Pinky Nai. Muniradri Bear Rauti, Sakalani Bastire. Mujana Health Worker. We got a boat dinadarimo, prior single under Saita Jaditachi. I am Bartana, a COVID nineteen number of Mara Mukherol Hella. I put the Mukama Gorthuli, Gorbati Mohammed and Nakra Jatna Nathuli. Tikka Koran Korothuli, our family planning Korothuli in the Bortaman to Covid nineteen Asila, they were Seupur Madam of the Kamo Diajaichi, Ame Horagoravuli Sarbe Koruchu, Jurage Ame Bohu, Oswita Samukino, Amu Max Diani, Ame Oni, Mora Bandiki, Sesu Kajakurtu, our Semtikichi, Saranjami with the Inanti Juragami Surakitre Kajakur Peribu, our Madia Amu Vicious Kitchi, Parisamiko Semtikichi, Muruni, say Kajapai, or Porisram of the Auchik into Sapin Kitchi Paris from Kodia Jauni, and the Bortman Koyakota more Prostava AJ, Amapai, the Omeman Pito Kamos of Koruzu, Amukudo Insurance, Provident of Fondra, Antarukta Parajau, Suraka Pokorano, Audi Odiava Amukia Diajau, our Paris from Matiamuku Milu, our Sustain Vagar of the Kitchi, Jodana Korajauzi, Visaskar Health Oper. Say somewhere Amanuti Antarukta Korajau. Jodoragi Amen is your summoned Amy Poi Peribu, even the Samadanam of the Amostor came in the Hay Peribu, and maybe said, Thank you, Johnny Peribu. Thank you, a team or a Thank you, Namaskar, to all. I am going to translate uh, about what exactly Pinky Nike said. Uh, Pinky uh, spoke, uh, she's a health worker, and she, uh, she long time she associated with the prior single window of office of CFR. And he key, uh, main key role uh, to convince women for instant delivery, immunization of children, and family planning, health seeking behavior. Uh, they, uh, Pinky Nike is doing. And main concern is of Pinky Nike that in the COVID 90 situation, face occupational risks with minimal protective gears and security no health insurance no fixed time no remuneration and in the in the covid 19 situation facing stigma discrimination from the wider society and some even from the families also that and subject to discriminated they also dignified treatment and uh, they uh, pinky like want to key rate recommendations on the behalf of all the health workers uh, she recommended that there should be uh, enable participation of health workers in planning and monitoring health intervention for the co communities and uh, should ensure that health workers are treated with the respect and as equals and okay. another he also recommended make provision personal protective equipment with the timely provisions and also uh, she also added one point uh, in the social uh, the insurance uh, should be provided them and that the core initiatives will be provided for them and another point he has added that in the extended social security benefit uh, like uh, employment state insurance and employment provided Front should be uh, provided them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so let's hear from the sanitation workers from Pakistan. Um, these sanitation workers belong uh, predominantly to a Christian minority. And for that, we'll hear from uh, Mary James Gill, who is a politician, lawyer, executive director of Center for Law and Justice. She also runs Pakistanis first advocacy campaign, Sweepers Are Superheroes. Uh, to outline horrific attitudes and work conditions towards sanitation workers. Uh, Ms. Mary James Gill, please. Uh, greetings from Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is the sixth largest country in the world with 210 million people. We exactly do not know the number of population living in irregular settlements, but only Karachi, which is the largest metropolitan in the country, has 60% of its population living in such slums. 
Hence, the mapping of these informal settlements is the key to assess adequate provision of wash facilities, especially during the, this pandemic. Religious minorities constitute only 3% of the population. However, more than 80% of the sanitation workforce comes from the Christian community in major metropolitan areas. These sanitation workers mostly live in irregular settlements where basic amenities like water supply and sewage infrastructure is missing. These settlements are excluded from development plans, which makes this population even more vulnerable. So there is need to lobby and advocacy for regularization, uh, regularization of these settlements so the basic amenities can be provided. Right to clean water and sanitation services is also not recognized as a basic right in Pakistan. And we believe and strive that wash rights should be recognized as a basic human right, leaving no one behind just because of their illegal housing and low socioeconomic st stigmatized status. During COVID-19, several such slums were declared red zones in the country and many of these localities were sealed, which shows that it is the high time to address the issue of irregular settlements. There's need to extend development policy and the concept of preferential development for uh, these settlements. Sanitation workers are without adequate protection, which means that they and their family are at risk of contracting the virus. They are not just manually cleaning the sewers or collecting hazardous waste, but also providing working as support staff in quarantine centers and isolation wards in the hospitals without any PPP or necessary training. These services are essential and- uh, Any seconds? Uh, so uh, thank you very much. At the end, I'll be sharing the additional information uh, in the chat box. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, we move to India again uh, for the homeless. We have Sunil Kumar Aledia, who is a social activist, executive director for Center for Holistic Development and national convener of National Forum for Homeless Housing Rights uh, in India. So please, uh, Sunil. Hi, everyone. Uh, these are the... I'm representing for the India uh, pandemic are not just a medical phenomenon. They have immense uh, psychosocial implication affecting society at large and in the particular the vulnerable and the homeless. Uh, COVID-19, uh, second, the COVID-19 poses a threat to the homeless on issue of urgent housing, water sanitation and uh, quarantine measures needed to contain the spread among the them. Third one, uh, here are some more factors that add to the susceptibility, social isolation and it's a, applicability poor living condition leading to poor immunity lack of information and testing gender and social neglect and lack of official responsibility and accountability uh, have there been an adequate responses or no the following finding can be seen as survey published on scroll and analyzes the state circulator regarding provision of lockdown relief for the uh, poor issued between uh, uh, march and may to show that the 16th state and 40% of the country homeless make no mention of to the them at all. Only Delhi, Maharashtra and Kerala talk about a regular health check and a safety provision for the homeless. Uh, only the government of Andhra Pradesh, Delhi, Karnataka and Maharashtra mentioned running awareness campaign on COVID-19 for the homeless. Especially awareness campaign, not the water and sanitation facility provided by the government. A uh, way to uh, identify involved most vulnerable needed survey, awareness campaign, uh, basic facilities. Government should take the help of a civil society organization and uh, uh, other NGOs and groups, RWAs, uh, also homeless collective. Uh, urgent recommendation is uh, providing shelter and food. Water and sanitation is uh, uh, the first then uh, providing essential uh, resources to maintain hygiene, testing for the virus among the vulnerable, accessibility to uh, mental health support, and uh, educating the homeless. But government is not, but government not providing a toilet and a uh, basic facility in the shelter home. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now we move to a representation from migrant workers from India. We have Ms. Ishwari, who is a construction worker. She's also a help desk member from Vinayaka Slam in Nayandahali Ward and has facilitated construction workers to link up with social security schemes, enabled pregnant women and lactating mothers to secure take home ration from ICDS, and organized immunization and monthly health checkup 
for all the construction workers in our slum. Please go ahead, Ishwari. Namaste. 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 Ali Unur the Adna Kukutumba the Jigi, Ipatai of Lida, Ali Wasawagi de Gurbne Ragli, Banti Ragli, Chikmak Ragli, Anganwadi, Government Task Patri, Injection, Poil Injection of Pudu, Adela Nane Prosti Dene, Bangalur Nagara, Nave, Katara, Katragal, Katu, Namagina, Sache, Sachele, Sache, Pudeniro. Mate current to Casa thirty, Namgian into Harker Little Savo Vesicula Namaga Idala Sigiba Kanta, now Karakala, now Bird can TV. Isan Sava, I got to Naya Kartiwe, Tingle Tingle, I had a serpent, you act before. Ishwarama represents the uh, construction workers uh, groups. She is uh, uh, from Vinayaka slum in uh, Bangalore, Karnataka. So uh, she is highlighting some of the concerns where uh, during the COVID-19, because of uh, you know lack of you know proper database of construction workers, so uh, the, there is no proper registration of construction workers uh, by the you know uh, department, and there is uh, because of COVID they don't get regular uh, wa uh, wages. There is no job security, uh, you know. And, uh, and they are working in very hazardous uh, situation without safety. And one of the uh, most important issues she is raising is that you know uh, uh, they are helping the you know nation to build uh, buildings and multi you know multi-storied buildings. But uh, most of the construction workers are living in a uh, living in a, uh, you know settlements where there is no basic uh, wash facilities, including safe drinking water, community toilet, all of that. So uh, she is, uh, you know, recommending that uh, they, the government should mandate uh, to register all the construction workers so that they will get all the social security benefits. And uh, during the COVID, uh, they should have some, you know, uh, essential for uh, from the municipal corporation to provide all the wash uh, facilities. And she is also uh, recommending that you know, uh, urban wage in employment initiatives should be rolled out in the state where uh, some of the states like Odisha, okay. Kerala and Himachal Pradesh also, you know, okay. introduced and uh, so, so, so that. Sorry, we have to stop. Can you finish that comment in the chat? I'm, I'm really sorry, guys, but we have to move because of time. Uh, so now we'd like to hear from the refugees side, Farida uh, Luanda, who is 20, 22 years old refugee from DRC based in Uganda. And she's a member of the UNSCR Global Youth Advisory Council. Ms. Farida, you have to go. Thank you. As COVID-19 pandemic spread across the globe, the Minister of Health advised everyone to wash hands frequently as a simple preventive measure against COVID-19. But 60% of people living in Chakatu refugee settlement did not have a hand washing facility with water and soap at their homes. This small but important action remained out of reach. I use available resources to make tippy taps and I use jerry cans from the oil we use in our homes. We use these jerry cans with ropes to make a reliable washing facility with my group, to, with the help of my group for each household in our community. We also educate the community on the benefits of hand washing and how they can use washing facilities and keep themselves and their homes clean. We supplied 800 tippet taps made from jelly cans. We have focused on people with disability, elderly, single mothers, and child mothers. I have obtained soap from partners to distribute for washing hands and keeping our homes clean. We also work with markets and business centers to install hand washing facilities. We have found that providing tippet taps and improving hygiene behaviors, especially amongst women and girls, also improves hygiene for the most vulnerable, including children. Thanks in part to the provision of tippet taps. Hygiene norms like hand washing are now well practiced in Chakatu settlement. However, gaps remain. There's still a shortage of soap. Many refugees in Uganda do not have access to an improved water source and the situation for sanitary toilets in good in good some some of the 
some, some of the areas are not are in good condition. During this COVID period, many actors are not able to work on the ground like before. Young women and men are doing an amazing job identifying and responding to the struggles that our community are facing. Working with young people has huge potential to leverage effort and investment. In my closing remarks, I would like to share a few recommendations for NGOs, UNHCR, and local authorities. Please recognize and reinforce the important work that we refugee youth have been doing. Partner with us. Ask us what we, is needed and support us in our efforts to reach more people in our communities. For example, supply us with the soap that we can distribute together with our tippy taps. Invest in clean and treated water for communities that don't yet have it and pity the trees where it is needed. Our goal is to make sure there's one tippy tap with the soap per household to promote our wash culture. Please Thank invest you, in youth and help us achieve this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Farida. Thank you, Farida. Uh, let's hear from Romania, from Margareta Matashe, who is an instructor and director of the Roma program, FXB Center for Health and Human Rights from Harvard University. Margareta, please. Thank you very much. 15 million Romani people live across the world. For centuries, anti-Roma racism and structural inequalities have impacted their lives. As the coronavirus outbreak has expanded, those challenges deepened, acquired new dimensions, and became more visible. Before and during the pandemic, a significant number of Romani homes have been denied access to water. 30% of Roma involved in a 2016 EU study had no running water. In Romania, 68% of Roma lived in households without tap water. The same applied to 33% of Roma in Hungary. 20% of the Roma interviewed in the same EU study lived in slums or ruined homes. The Roma neighborhood in Faculteta in Bulgaria has not seen waste collection, water, or sanitation in decades. In France, more than 15,000 Roma live in slums and shacks on the outskirts of cities. In Romania, in Patarut, known as Europe's largest waste-related ghetto, more than 1,500 Roma live in toxic and dangerous conditions. Governments must end the forced relocation of Roma into remote, toxic, and waste-dumped areas and repair the harm done to families having experienced such injustices. To prevent the spread of COVID-19 and ensure human rights, government responses must seriously address structural inequalities. Furthermore, across the world, a violent wave of anti-Romani racism by the police, policymakers, media, and others is putting Romani families at risk. In March, three municipalities in Brazil expelled itinerant Cologne Roma communities. In April, in Slovakia, a police officer beat five Romani children and threatened to shoot them. In May, in Spain, a vigilante murdered a Romani man before the eyes of his seven years old son. We call on governments and intergovernmental organizations to put in place concrete measures to prevent the racialization of the pandemic and to protect Roma living in marginalized settlements. We call on governments to enforce public policies that aim to ensure that Roma families have access, equal access to social and economic rights, including water, sanitation, and adequate housing. We urge governments to recognize and address anti-Romani racism and all its manifestations and implement anti-racist public policies. We call on governments and the UN to recognize and ensure reparations for past and present injustices, including enslavement in Romania and lead poisoning of Roma in Mitrovica, Kosovo. Thank you very much uh, for keeping time as well, Margareta. Next is uh, Marian Cassina, the co-founder of Kayole Community Justice Center and convener of Women in Justice Centers from Nairobi. Uh, Marian, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, this is my presentation, uh, the challenges that women are facing and girls here in Kenya and from informal settlements. Uh, uh, we have issue and it's a challenge uh, acute water shortage, lack of menstrual products, and uh, the recommendations are to have provision of clean water to all households and community spaces, and also to have sustainable provision of menstrual products. Why, why, why am I saying this? It's because the issue of water it has become a, a crisis, and knowing uh, due to the precautions that have given out the World Health Organization, uh, it's to wash our hands regularly and also to maintain our hygiene. We need water to flow in our tap. Really, we do not have water in our tap. We do not know how we are going to survive during this COVID-19. And we think it's going to increase more. Uh, we are going to, the number of uh, people infected by uh, COVID, uh, by the coronavirus must be high due to lack of uh, water. 
Uh, and the issue of uh, sustainable provision of menstrual products, uh, as in the, why we recommend it for that, we think uh, and we need, and something that we be pushing as women, that menstrual products should be for free. Since women cannot access menstrual products, an issue of uh, menstrual is something that is natural for women. Women have to menstruate. It's natural. So we do not know why we are still pushing the agenda of uh, menstrual products still today. And we can see how the, the, the issue of teenage pregnancy is being rampant because uh, women and girls cannot access uh, menstrual products. So those are the things that we need uh, uh, to be looked on about. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, we move yeah. now to another uh, speaker from India on uh, sex, uh, representing the voice of sex workers, Mr. Amit Kumar, who is the coordinator of All India Network of Sex Workers. Uh, Mr. Amit, please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Rose. Uh, so the sex worker profession requires close contact with clients for which they need to maintain health and hygiene practices. And during COVID, it's more important need, but unfortunately, sex workers are left behind in this whole discussion. No sanitation drive, no picking of garbage, no clean water facility have done during the lockdown in red light areas. Although, no proper water supply at red light areas in normal days. During nationwide lockdown, sex workers were unable to purchase packed water. Waste disposal is a very important issue in connection to the sex workers, as in most places, sex workers have been habituated to use condoms in red light areas. There will be a heavy collection of used after use condoms and with, without proper disposal mechanism, it will pollute both physical and social environment. Another important issue is to use sanitary napkins, which must be part of wash program. Proper use of sanitary napkins can minimize the problems. Besides the menstrual cycle, sex workers will be more vulnerable to acquiring infection. Issues of sex workers based on their geographical circumstances. Like in rural India, accessibility and affordability of wash services are the major concern but, but in urban and semi-urban issues might different so but in general affordability accessibility and availability of wash wash is major concern among the sex workers in general there are a lot of stigma discrimination happen with the sex workers community due to the due to their work profile so moral policing is a also major concern criminalization of sex work is the root cause of non-accessibility and non-availability of basic rights and register any complaint. So sex work should be decriminalized now to enable all sex workers to access all the schemes entitled by land of law. So demands and recommendations are proper supply of quality water, free mass distribution with HIV programs, regular sanitation drive in red light area, the addition of regular cleaning of residential sites, include menstrual hygiene part of wash program. Swachh Bharat mission must provide space for marginal community to speak about their issues. Curtail requirement of so many documents to apply for toilet construction aid. program related to wash as soon as possible. Such a degree mechanism must be included on the basic of basis of human values, which have no chance to stigma, discrimination, and ill behavior. Start process to include the wash as basic human rights. A special training sessions for the sex workers should organize to aware them about wash facilities. And thank you. plan of action thank you. target to made on the basis of typology of sex work and geographically. Thank, thank you, you so much. Mitch. Thank you. Thank you. Now we just have uh, one more person uh, that we'll, uh, we'll hear from, from transgender group as well, LGBT. Um, Mr. Manoj Benjoel, who is a program officer of the Hams Fire Trust oldest LGBT CBO in India. Mr. Manoj, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Manoj. In outbreak of COVID-19 and water sanitization issue, transgender and LGBT people who are equal citizen of the country as per the law and all their rights should be protected under the Constitution of India as per the other citizens of country. However, because of their sexual orientation and gender identity, they are neglected community and are not included in the development factors. They have an equal right to education, health, housing, water, and sanitization, employment, and all other social protection scheme initiated by the state and central government of India. But because of stigma, discrimination, and bullying in school, healthcare setting, workplace, and other social places, they can't fully access equal opportunity, resulting in so socially, politically, and economically weak. As per the constitution, all the policies and laws should grant provision uh, for water and sanitization for transgender and LGBT people. 
because of social stigma and discrimination nobody wants to give the house on rent because of lower economic status that they are forced to live in slum uh, where they have to live with a, with poor facility without clean water and dignified sanitization services there are a provision in transgender protection bill but the bill is not yet implemented on ground level as community based organization the hum sapar trust support ration medical the medical distribution around 25000 community person during the covid 19 pandemic but it is not sufficient for the, the pan pan india level also the government never talk about the uh, separate quarantine center during the covid 19 period my recommendation is there is no safety law for protection transgender and lgbt community to access water sanitization services due to bully harassment and violence lead to mental health issue impacting their overall growth we need to emphasize inclusivity to ensure about transgender lgbt community for water and sanitization program policies health insurance hiv positive transgender community health insurance and workplace also sensitize mainstream society for alternative identity and orientation thank you thank you very much uh, manoj and that brings us to the end of this session where we've had the voices directly from the vulnerable groups or representatives of vulnerable groups i will not try to summarize that because uh, the next session will be trying to respond to the issues that have been raised uh, but it's very clear that the interconnectedness of the human rights to basic services is very Uh, loud and clear from these interventions. So I hand over back to you, Enrico, and thank you very much, the speakers who have presented very detailed and very wide uh, research and well-researched uh, information for this group. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. It was not easy to moderate 16 <laughs> participants in a row at this speed. Uh, you did it. So congratulations. Uh, I will not speak longer, therefore, and give the floor to Luisa Gosling, Senior Wash Manager from WaterAid. Uh, accountability and rights. Uh, please, Luisa, you can moderate uh, the session on reactions from governments, UN agencies, and all the stakeholders. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Enrico, and uh, thank you very much, Rose, for your amazing moderation. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and WaterAid is also very happy to be able to uh, co-convene this really important discussion. We are also going to be very ask for very quick um, contributions to react for to react to what we have heard of the issues that have been raised uh, that we have just heard from different vulnerable groups. Um, I would like to start by welcoming Benjamin McComen, who is the Chief Public Health Officer from the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Uh, you have three and a half minutes, Benjamin, just to tell us your response to this, uh, what you have heard so far. Thank you. Benjamin, are you there? Okay. Okay, I think is he Maybe have you seen the mic is muted anyway we are checking uh, the technical issues. Uh, be be okay, Benjamin you can go eh? Unmute yourself and and you can speak. Benjamin, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Please go ahead, Benjamin. Um, thank you very much, uh, all all the presenters. I've heard uh, from the teams and the presentation from Kenya. What I just want to say is that uh, the government of Kenya has put in place some policies to address some of the challenges, especially in the devolved governance. I will mention one of the policies that was launched recently, menstrual hygiene policy, which is uh, addressing some of the challenges of menstrual hygiene. And with this COVID-19, the issues of WASH, the county governments are now progressively addressing the issue of access to water, and uh, sanitation so and uh, we're looking forward to ensure that we we bridge the gap between the uh, marginalized and those who have access to water especially for those who had uh, some of the urban areas they have challenges and the informal settlement they still have challenges 
but progressively I can say that the government is working towards achieving this realization of SDG 6 and especially to reduce the risks of COVID-19. I submit, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very ooh. Thank you very much, Benjamin. That was really a nice and concise response to that. Um, so the next person to, that we would like to invite to speak is Alex Manyasi, who is the WSSCC National Coordinator, also from Kenya. So Alex, are you there? And are you able to take the mic and put on your video, please? One second, uh, we are checking uh, technical uh, dimension. Alex Manyazi. Is he there? Okay. He's there, he's there. Maybe. Okay, Alex, go ahead, please. One sec, uh, you will be able to speak within a matter of seconds. Alex, unmute, please. Yes, now I now I can. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've I'm been on in position, and and I'm happy that uh, uh, for the first time there is uh, discussion with the people who who matter the most, and that is the groups that um, are, are most left behind. And just to mention one or two things um, from Kenya. Um, we are currently in the process of mapping all the vulnerable groups in Kenya. So what this will do is that it will give us an opportunity to know exactly who the vulnerable groups are and where they are uh, in the country. And, and what that will do is that it will um, inform uh, government in terms of... Um, Sorry, there was a bit of noise. Um, what that will do is that uh, it will form government in terms of the, uh, the targeted approach uh, to, to serving the vulnerable groups. Uh, what we are going to do, this exercise is going to take about a month from today. And um, once that is done, we'll share with stakeholders. Um, and then after that, we will obviously be working closely with government to ensure that the policy interventions, um, because we know that there are several policies, and Benjamin already mentioned the MHM policy, for example, uh, that the policies that do exist, we will be looking at whether there are gaps in terms of, um, if you're talking about persons with disabilities, for example, um, then we work with those institutions to look at uh, if there are any gaps um, on matters, uh, people who living with disabilities and whether they are accessing the services that should be accessing. What we have also seen in this country is that uh, sometimes uh, we could be having policies, but those policies are general and therefore if they're not targeted, then they do not uh, end up with the outcomes that we would expect. And so to make sure Sorry, that no one is left behind. Alex, can I just interrupt for one second? Benjamin, I think your video is still on and your mic. Could you turn that off, please? Because so it doesn't interfere. Thank you very much. Okay, carry on, Alex. Sorry about that. Um, so in conclusion, I want to say that this is um, a very good starting point in terms of just ensuring that uh, the interventions are targeted. And if we are going to end up with targeted um, interventions, then ultimately, if we can pull the large groups of people that are left behind uh, to at least a certain point, then we are more likely to win the war, other than um, uh, focusing on everybody without having uh, to know where everybody, especially those who are left behind are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for the very clear and well thought out um, suggestions to respond to what you're hearing. I would like to now go, go over to Joanne Kiri, who is the Director for Government Affairs in Sanergy, also in Kenya. Thank you for the introduction, Louisa. Um, I'll first start by um, addressing what is the impact of COVID-19 to residents of informal settlements. Informal settlements of Kenya are densely populated. World Bank estimates about 56% um, of, the, of urban, the urban population lives in slum. At the same time, the informal settlements lack adequate basic service, services such as safely managed sanitation. It's for these reasons the residents of urban informal settlements are particularly vulnerable 
to the exposure of COVID-19 and its impact. This impact also includes the risk of, of contracting secondary diseases. Why then is it critical to include urban residents in WASH responses? Given the context of urban slums, COVID-19 preventative measures such as social distancing, isolation, and staying at home are a challenge to implement in urban informal settlements. So how is Sanergy collaborating with these communities to combat COVID-19? Over the years, Sanergy has built a strong network of over 2,000 sanitation champions called Fresh Life Operators who provide sanitation services to the communities. With training from our, our team on importance of hygiene practices such as proper hand washing and provision of hygiene tools, which include toilet cleaning tools as well as a hand washing station and soap as well. We have been able to empower them to promote an overall positive behavior change among children and adults alike. Having seen the value of access to a clean and safe toilet, our Fresh Life operators have also been on the front lines of referring the Fresh Life solution to their friends and neighbors and increasing access by installing additional toilets. In terms of lunch, more toilets in the communities, which reduces overcrowding at public toilets and also have increased hand washing hygiene practices. At the same time, Sanage has built a team from the communities we serve. All of these people have a personal connection to Sanage's mission. They also desire to see their communities clean and the people healthy. Therefore, they easily take ownership and convey, con convey the value of hygienic sanitation, thereby accelerating behavior change within the communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for, thank you for also keeping it within the time. Um, so uh, now I'd like to go over to Klaas Moldeus, who is the associate expert at UN Water on how the SDG 6 acceleration framework can contribute and respond to the vulnerable group concerns and the leave no one behind agenda. Uh, Klaas, over to you. Thanks so much, Luisa. Uh, and hi, everyone. I'm Klaus Molius from UN Water, which is the coordination mechanism for UN's work on water and sanitation. And thank you so much to all participants for sharing your important perspectives and recommendations with us today. And we already knew before COVID hit that SG6 on water and sanitation was far off track. But your stories today highlights just how hard hit marginalized communities have been by the pandemic and how urgent our action is to accelerate provision to safe water and sanitation. So to address this, uh, two weeks ago, as Rio mentioned in the beginning, over 30 UN entities and 40 international partners acting through UN Water and including WSSEC, OHCHR, Water Aid. Uh, launched the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework. So what is this really about? It's, it's really about four things. The first one is about engaging better, which is listening to needs on the ground. And this roundtable discussion is a good example of this, where we really can hear your recommendation. Then it's about aligning our response to these needs across sectors, government, private sector, social society, and UN. And thirdly, it's about accelerate progress through five key enablers, which include improved financing, data sharing, human capacity, innovation, and governance. And lastly, it's about strengthening accountability and follow up to ensure that progress is really happening on the ground. So that's about uh, the acceleration framework. And while COVID-19 has been an unprecedented crisis. I think your stories today also highlight opportunities to build back better from COVID-19 that can be supported by the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework. The first point is the importance of investing in long-term solutions for water and sanitation instead of quick fixes. The second thing that stands out to me is uh, the need to have a core focus on addressing inequalities, whether in gender, age, social situation, people with disabilities, refugees, etc. And the third one is about interlinkages with collaboration between sectors, health, housing, water and sanitation, etc. So thanks again for sharing your stories, perspectives and inspiring actions today. At the end, this is really what the SG6 Global Acceleration Framework builds on. So thank you, and at UN Water, we look forward to moving forward together with you. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Klaus. And um, I, I think especially uh, people will be interested to hear about that and particularly the opportunities for the, this point of unaccountability to make sure that that's really happening and, and reaching the vulnerable groups who've been represented here today. Um, our next uh, contributor is Michael Bayani, but I'm not sure that he's here. Is that right? Enrico? I don't see him there. Okay, so I'd like to go on then in that case to Dr. Narula Awal, who is a health advisor of WaterAid in Bangladesh, uh, to hear how WaterAid is responding to the concerns that have been raised here or can, can, can respond. Thank you, Dr. Narula. Is he here? Is Dr. Narula here? He's there. Is, should I mute yeah, can you, yeah, can uh, you hear now, me now? now can, yeah, now we can hear you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Luisa, and good, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Nurullah. I'm the health advisor at WaterAid in Bangladesh. WaterAid in Bangladesh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Local Government, City Corporation, and the local NGOs, has been implementing interventions for support, hygiene promotion, hygiene awareness, and promotion of hand washing in the slums of Dhaka, Chittagong, Kulna, with the slogan for our work as Fight Corona United. Many of you know that the slums in Bangladesh are heavily overcrowded with, an, uh, with the average population size of over 200,000 per square kilometer, where percent of the households actually share their toilet facilities, 65% of the slum shares their water source, and also 75% of households live in a uh, in one room in the uh, slums. So within the project, uh, WaterAid tried to cover over half million population in 157 slums of uh, low income communities. These interventions aim to reduce the risk of coronavirus among the target communities through increased uh, access to hand washing facilities, enough supply of soap, soapy water, and supervised practice of hand washing. We tried useful and effective knowledge dissemination and ensured increased awareness among the target communities. From WaterAid, the responses were installation of context-specific hand washing facilities at the entry points of slums and any other convenient place, appointment of volunteers, their training, distribution of hygiene kits, soaps, masks, and environmental disinfection campaign at the slums. Also, IEC development and distribution. The key implementation approach that we followed were used online, online platforms so that all the meetings, trainings, monitoring, and even uh, community uh, communication was over phone mostly. We followed the community-led approach so that the capacity development and the community could monitor the program. And also we tried to minimize the risk by reducing exposure of projects so that the installation are fixed outside, offsite of the construction and uh, put installed in the field. But the major challenges that we found were slums are very crowded and we are advocating for safe distancing, which is actually difficult. And also we advocate for hand washing, but water is a very crisis in many areas of the slums, especially in the summer season. So our recommendation- Thank you very, very much, Dr. Narula. Thank you very much. Um, we need thank to- you. Um, cover in the chat box. If you can cover in the chat box. Thank you very much. And thank you to all, the in, to all of those interventions. And now I'll hand back over to uh, Enrico. Thank you, Luisa. And thank you, Dr. Nurulla. Sorry for cutting you. We are uh, reaching the end. We are right on time. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to Mr. Balakrishnan Rajagopal, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing. Please, uh, Dr. Rajagopal, uh, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, Enrico. Can you hear me? Yes, very oh. well. OK. Okay, thank you uh, very much. And uh, thank you also to the WSSCC, WaterAid, and all the organizations for organizing this. And uh, of course, to all the um, organizations and individuals who uh, shared their experiences and their viewpoints today, uh, it's been uh, very important for me. Uh, I also thank the government representatives uh, who participated. Now, uh, human rights and informal settlements, of course, have been key to uh, my mandate on the right to adequate housing and that of the previous rapporteurs for many, many years. Um, uh, given that uh, it's a very large problem, more than a billion people, uh, at least a quarter of the world's urban population 
lives in informal settlements. And uh, the conditions that have prevailed in informal settlements have uh, persistently witnessed a violation of the basic uh, requirements of right to adequate housing, starting with the basic issue of security of tenure, because they're always at the risk of getting evicted, for example. Um, now, my first report to, as the special rapporteur uh, is going to be on COVID-19 and the right to adequate housing. And it's just getting finished as we speak this week, actually. And um, uh, of course, you know, there is a big emphasis on vulnerable groups uh, in the report. And uh, what has been also uh, useful for me is to build on the work of the previous rapporteur, uh, Leilani Farha, particularly I would draw attention to her guidance note that she issued uh, in April on uh, COVID-19 and informal settlements. Um, and um, the many issues that have been raised today, uh, of course, uh, are issues that uh, I think were known or predicted. Uh, for example, the fact that uh, social distancing would be really difficult given the the density of population of informal settlements was predicted well known. The issue of access to water and sanitation or lack of it was well known. Uh, and so the question of how the people will wash their hands and uh, follow hygienic practices was one of the questions that came about. Um, can, you, can you please unmute? Oh, can you? Yeah, thank you. Um, the, uh, the question of availability of services, uh, the extent to which health services or even other services were actually available to um, you know, people living in informal settlements has been, of course, uh, an older issue that has been around with us. And uh, particularly <laughs> given the fact that many people who live in informal settlements live in degraded land, uh, uh, parts of cities where, which are prone, for example, to greater flooding regularly. Um, this has been a major concern. Uh, what happens when you combine a massive health crisis or a pandemic on top of uh, the degraded conditions that prevail already in informal settlements? Um, what has also come out very clearly in the responses, particularly that I received uh, 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 for my report, when I issued a call for inputs into my report, or uh, the, uh, the dimensions that were highlighted in the presentations today, um, that uh, not only has there been a massive and catastrophic economic impact on people living in informal settlements, the loss of livelihoods and incomes has been a massive crisis, and it has actually not helped that some of the countries that have actually put together benefits programs for people affected by the crisis have not quite managed to do a thorough job of extending it to people living in informal settlements. Uh, and uh, the other dimension that was pointed out today in many presentations, the social and cultural impacts uh, and the psychological impacts on many vulnerable groups, particularly, for example, older persons, uh, is something that is coming out much more starkly than what we could anticipate. You know, in April, when the, uh, the, when the uh, guidance note was put out by my predecessor, it, it wasn't so clear that the psychological impacts were going to be so grave. Um, all of these conditions together, I would say, uh, constitute a grave violation of international law, particularly Article 11 of the International Covenant on uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, as well as, of course, uh, point out how much we have fallen behind in trying to fulfill the uh, commitments made under SDG um, Goal 6, but also Goal 11. Um, so uh, I believe I have probably run out of time, uh, but I just want to say that the question of informal settlements for me is a global problem. It is one that is as much prevalent in the global north as it is in the global south. In the country where I live, for example, it just takes a different form. 
in the United States, we have encampments uh, that are regularly cleared. For example, uh, the way evictions are happening in informal settlements. And I, this is one thing I, I must say, I regret to say that even in the, at the height of uh, the pandemic, many governments are continuing to evict people in informal settlements. And I, it's happening in countries like Kenya, for example, where I've communicated my concerns. Uh, and unfortunately, in, in, in the Kenyan case, the eviction actually happened in the name of a water and sanitation project. Uh, so we must ask ourselves questions about, you know, what we can do to push governments to simply stop doing harm in the first place. You know, do no harm as a first principle, as in medical ethics. And then, of course, pursue many of the valuable recommendations and suggestions that have been put forward. So th with that, I would say thank you again uh, very much. Uh, the COVID-19's impact, of course, is not over yet. It's continuing and it could get worse or better depending on the pathway of the virus, but also the responses by governments and society over the next several months. So there is a need for solidarity and there is a need for urgent action for which all your recommendations have been extremely valuable and useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajakap Gopal. Uh, it was a very interesting intervention. Uh, summarizing all these human rights dimensions that are uh, maybe sometimes overlooked when we talk about WASH and when we talk about housing and development in general. So uh, we are reaching the end of our uh, round table uh, and uh, we are uh, even a little bit in advance, which was really not expected even by us. So thanks to all the participants for uh, the great efforts to prepare concise presentations. We will always uh, be able to input more before leaving through the chat box uh, and also all those who have my email or uh, email uh, of uh, my collaborators, so you can send it to us. Uh, we will use it for the report. And now I would like to give the floor again to James Weekend uh, for the closing remarks on behalf of WSSCC. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, sitting, sitting at home alone here um, in Cambodia for the last few hours, it's been extremely moving to, to see and hear all of you talking about these very big challenges that you're experiencing across the world. Um, we're all working on these issues day in, day out. However, for me, this has been the, the first time during the pandemic that I've heard firsthand from such a range of of people from key populations and different groups across the world at one time. I say it's been, um, it's been very moving. One of the first speakers, uh, Li Feng, I think said at the start of this webinar, and all of these testimonies show so powerfully, it's clear that the pandemic is, is making these inequalities even greater, uh, deepening and adding new dimensions that, you, that you've all talked about. Um, at the same time, I've been truly inspired to hear about all the creative ways that you are finding to address this in your communities and to hear these very clear recommendations to duty bearers on what can be done. We, you are doing so much and, it's, and the ideas that you have about what needs to be done have come through so clearly. Um, and one of the key takeaways, once again, I think for all of us is that WASH actors alone um, cannot do this. We need to work even more across sectors. This is now a truly, truly intersectoral challenge. And um, I know that's just been made, that point's just been made in the chat box. Um, now, it's been two hours we've been together. This is a very short time, but it is part of a longer process. And on behalf of the co-organizers here today from, uh, from WaterAid, from the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. Uh, we do you know, strongly commit to, to document what's being said here today and to use that to amplify these voices at events and fora in the months ahead um, within the UN system and beyond. Um, to help us do that and to help us to continue to collaborate together, before you leave the webinar today, Please, could I ask you to write in the chat box um, your full name, your professional title and organization, your country, 
and most importantly, your, your email address. And we will use that to, to stay in touch. And thank you for many of you who've already done that and for the very rich contributions that have been made by participants in the chat box over the last few hours. I, I have drawn uh, strength from hearing of your compassion and your spirit. And I, will, I believe that you will also leave the webinar now encouraged to keep on going in the weeks and months ahead with renewed passion. Um, stay safe and continue to look after one another. Finally, let me thank Rose and Louisa for steering us through those sessions. Uh, and especially, I'd like to thank on behalf of all of us, I'm sure, Enrico, for your dedication to make this webinar happen, for bringing together such a diverse group and managing the time so well, and all of your preparation in organizing us. Deep thanks, Enrico, and let me hand back to you to, to close the webinar. Many thanks, James. I think that, uh, well, we succeeded in finishing earlier than expected. I don't want to waste uh, anybody's time any longer. So thank you, everyone. Keep in touch with us. And uh, those who didn't do it yet, as already reminded by James, send your email if you want to get the report. A report will be produced over the next month, and in September you will get it, hopefully. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll continue for the next steps.